Today we have a classic Marconi 238. This is a shortwave radio manufactured in 1948. Pick this one up at an antique shop. I have no idea what's wrong with it. I'd have no idea whether we're going to get it working today or not. You'll have to find out, but let's check this sucker out. So this is the unit. It's in really good shape. As you see, it's got five presets, so you can set five stations. And these would have been the original stations that would have been used on this radio when it was new. Now, the date code on this one is August 1948, so this makes this radio 70 years old this year. And as I say, I got this at the local antique shop the same time I got the GE that it repaired in the prior video. But this one's going to say kind of unique because it does have these presets on it. I'm anxious to see whether this radio is going to actually work or not. Now, the first thing we're going to have to do, of course, is we're going to have to replace all of the caps in it because you know that they're going to be gone. But look at the cabinet on this. Other than a few scratches in it, it's actually in very good shape. Look around the back. All the tubes are present. Say I don't know if they're any good or not, but we'll find that out pretty quick. So here's how you set those frequencies for the presets. On the back here, it has a series of slugs, which you can set to your favorite radio stations. You can have five presets all tuned with these slugs. This is a Marconi 238. I'm going to see if I can find some paperwork on this before I even get into it. Made in Canada, Canadian Marconi. Marconi had a couple manufacturing plants in Canada. As you can see, they're listed as Canadian Marconi Company. Vancouver, Winnipeg, Montreal, Toronto, Halifax, St. John's, Newfoundland. Where this one was actually made, I don't know, but that would be where they, they, had, their, they had offices here in Vancouver as well. I don't know whether they actually made, manufactured any radios here or not, but it's definitely a local radio company made in Canada. All the parts are going to be made in Canada. This is going to be an interesting one. This is my radio. I picked this up at the antique shop at the same time as I picked up that other GE. Let's get started on this one and see if we can get this one working. So the Marconi 238, which is the tabletop version radio, and the 243 was the same radio with a phonograph built in. Uh, dates to 1947. In 1947, this one sold for $89. The console version retailed at like $284. So not a lot of people would have had this one because that was a lot of money back in 1948 when this was made. Even $89, that was a lot of money. Let's look at the specifications on this. It uh, has two watts of undistorted output, but four watts with full distortion. Uh, broadcast band 540 to 1720, and then six to 18 megahertz on shortwave. This one gives us our plate voltages and so forth to work with, which is nice. Got all the information, tube layout. I've got the diagram. I've got the chart inside the box anyway that shows me where the tubes go. And most importantly, I have a print to work with. So, time to pull the chassis. We're going to start replacing caps on this thing and see if anything will work on it. I'm hopeful that uh, this one's going to work. This one's got a tuning eye on it as well, which is kind of nice. Uh, a lot of radios don't have the magic eye, the tuner eye on the front. So I hope that that works on this one as well. I guess I have to pull the knobs off the front first before the radio is going to come apart. Bakelite knobs. All original. This radio is actually in very good condition considering the age of it. Very good. Couple little scuffs here. This will buff right out, no problem. Okay, what else is holding this up here? It was just the buttons on the front were sticking a bit because this has got the presets. They were kind of sticking a bit in the in the front cabinet, so I'm just going to take the wooden box and put it out of the way so it doesn't get uh, damaged while we're working on this set. It's Look at the bottom of this one. It's got a nice big uh, 
metal plate in the way. It's going to make servicing this one fun <laughs> with all these switches on it for the presets. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the tuning eye tube just so that it doesn't get damaged because uh, if this set were to fall over I'm not even going to remove it from that holder I'll just take the whole holder out if this were to fall over it's going to smash this tube so we're going to remove this and just store it safely out of the way until I'm ready to test the radio yeah this comes out This piece lifts out as a separate piece. We can undo these wires. Cool. They even thought of everything. Everything plugs in. Check this out. White, yellow, orange, red. And they just unplug. Well, they're supposed to unplug. gonna mark these just because these two colors look almost the same so I'm just gonna mark a band on here I'll mark a, a black a black stripe on here just so I know going forward as to which one is which Takes that out of the way, and then there's two more on the other side that we can take out. These ones are marked yellow and white as well, and this one I can see the yellow wire on this, so I don't need to mark it. There. I've got the tuning unit out. That's going to be kind of cool. We got about five radio stations that we can pick up here. So guess what? We'll be setting these to the five radio stations that can be received here. And I'll clean all those switches up. I guess we could call this an early modular design. But that's out of the way. So now I can uh, get to work on changing out all these paper condensers and I picked up a bunch of new ones yesterday so that I've got I should have what I need to get this unit operating today fingers crossed I'm not going to change out these ones at this point I'm just going to do the, the big paper ones because these ones here you know that these ones are gone these ones are bad no matter what well there we go the heat just went off so my workshop is not now nice and toasty warm and that probably just cost me a dollar. That uh, that heater there is uh, a hell heating element is 4,800 watts, and then I think the fan is 200. It's five kilowatts anyway. Um, it's uh, it's a big one. Does a pretty good job though. Makes this place nice and uh, toasty warm. But man, when that thing's running, the hydrometer is spinning like you wouldn't believe. I'm just uh, giving my soldering iron a chance to warm up and we'll just start down here. We'll start changing out all these old caps. These ones here are marked with outside foil and I haven't identified these ones yet but I will be doing that before putting them in just because it's a new batch. They all are probably the same. Usually it's the same. All the like brands. Sometimes the outside foil is on one side on some brands of caps and the other side and outside foil maybe I should explain that to people that are not familiar with it with the term outside foil we can actually do it I'll, I'll demo it off of an old capacitor here when I take it out okay before we can talk about outside foil we have to understand 
heater just come back on how how it can be influenced um, right now what I've got is I've got my I've got my scope connected to the side marked outside foil and I've got the ground connected to the other side and as you can see the noise level on the scope we're picking up a bit of influence this is just from incidental noise AC induction I should say a little bit of AC induction if I connect the scope probe to the outside foil and connect the scope input to the inside foil as you can see there's less noise we'll switch it back around so there's it's connected there we'll switch it back around the other way and now as you can see there's a little bit more noise well I'll, I'll explain what the uh, outside foil is actually we'll demonstrate it I'll take it apart and we'll take a look at the capacitor inside So inside the capacitor, underneath this paper, the paper jacket, we'll get down to the foil layer here, and you'll find that one of these leads, which was this one here, was connected to, this cap was completely shot, it's shorted, it's all melted, but it was connected to the outside of the two foil so here's our foil strips, right? And basically what you have is you have some paper that's got the uh, electrolytic on it. In this case, the electrolytic was the paper. And you've got an outside and an inside foil. And the one on the outside is connected to the terminal that's marked outside foil. The reason that, that you needed to know which plate was connected to the capacitor and which one was connected to the inside foil was the one on the outside of course is exposed to the elements it is shielding the inside or the other side of the foil this side here being the inside of the foil the outside is shielding the inside foil so normally you would connect that to your low impedance side or your ground Putting it in backwards is not going to hurt anything because these are not polarized capacitors. But what can happen is if this outside foil is connected to your grid of your next stage, any noise that's in the air from RF interference, uh, radio interference, or electrical interference, any electrical noise that's in the air <clears throat> can be picked up by this exposed foil. The inside foil is going to be shielded by the outside foil. So that is why they are marked. They're marked for no other reason. And as you can see along here, this edge is where it was connected. If we unroll it all the way, we'll find that the other side should be connected to the other end of the capacitor. Oh, it's come off there, but anyway. One side is connected to the inside foil and the other side's connected to the outside and that's all that that means when you see outside foil there's your two foil strips separated by paper and that's all that's in these and the, the problem that happens with these old capacitors is that this paper here for this insulating material which is just paper it breaks down and it starts to become acidic and once it becomes acidic, it starts to become leaky. And it quite often attacks the metals here at the end caps and allows them to start shorting out to the other side of the capacitor. So basically, it turns 
a capacitor into a resistor. And that's why they have to be replaced because what happens is the job of one of these capacitors or all these capacitors, the job is to block the DC signals from getting from one stage to the next. So if we look at the schematic, for example, here you've got your plate on your 6 AT6 and your plate is charged up with B plus through its bias resistor. That's what provides the voltage to the plate. And as the plate is going in and out of conduction, which is controlled from its grid, the voltage is fluctuating up and down, but it's still at your B plus potential. And that B plus cannot get to the next tube because obviously if you have a couple hundred volts coming into the grid, what's gonna to happen to that tube, right? If you've got a couple hundred volts DC or any volts DC on here for that matter, um, that grid wants to be sitting at ground pretty much. And it will be because there's a 0.47 meg resistor keeping the grid at ground. What gets through this capacitor is the audio signal. The, the fluctuating audio signal will make it through the capacitor. The DC component is blocked. The audio signal gets in, the audio signal makes it to the grid, and the grid modulates the plate of the next stage. When the capacitors go bad and they start to leak, all of a sudden you've got DC voltage leaking through the capacitor. That DC voltage will bring that tube into conduction, which means that you've got a high level of current flowing through the tube at all times, even when there's no sound. You've got a lot of current flowing through the tube. When you've got a lot of current flowing through the tube, that current is going to go through the audio output transformer and it's going to overheat the primary winding of that because this is not designed to pass a high DC current. This is only designed to pass the audio frequencies and send them off to the speaker. So that's why we change the capacitors because when you have a bad capacitor, um, you get a DC voltage bleeding through which will cause the next stage to go into conduction and can cause things like your speaker output transformer to fail or in the case of some of your IF stages here you can actually burn out your IF stages or just completely desensitize the receiver depending on how the stages are coupled. So in a, in a, a situation like this the outside foil would typically go to the plate side of the, uh, the previous section and the inside foil goes to the low impedance side or for the, uh, the, the input to the next tube. That way um, you're not going to end up with a lot of hum and a lot of noise and so forth. So let's get uh, changing these parts and uh, say the, the older parts, the older larger capacitors, they will show a much higher noise um, floor on them when you're looking at them on the scope for your outside foil and your inside foil. These new ones here are much more difficult to actually determine which is the outside foil because the surface area is much smaller. You can do it, you just hold it in your hand and let your body act to induce the signal into them and you'll see a level difference between one polarity and the other. But it's not as big a deal, it's not as, it's not as critical as it was with the older capacitors just because these ones are much smaller physically in size. So the exposed surface area is also much lower on these. So it's not a big deal. I, I put them in the way that they came out. I always try to find which is the outside foil and put them in that way. But it's not as big a deal as some people might make you believe. And if I put them in backwards, you probably would never hear it. The, the, these radios are not dead silent to begin with. There's always a certain amount of hum. And if you're getting an extra 0.1 dB of hum, you're probably not going to notice it. But I checked them and put them in, you know, put the low impedance side to the next stage, just out of practice. But it's a lot of times it's overblown. And that's why they don't even bother to mark the capacitors anymore because it's not as big a deal as it was back in the early days of these ones, which just because of their physical size, there's a lot of surface area that's exposed that's going to pick up induction from outside of the radio, from other stages and from RF and from just from electrical interference. There's a much bigger chance that something like this is going to pick up induction than say something that is uh, this size.
I'm just connecting this one up to the stub that I cut off the other one. Just because it's easier to get at. And it's just going to ground anyway, so. And as we know, my iron's not hot enough to actually solder right to the chassis, so. Made in Canada. That one's a point zero zero seven. So I gotta find the next size I can put in there. Point zero zero four seven. That's a point zero zero seven. So two point zero zero four sevens in parallel give me about point zero zero eight or almost point zero well point zero zero eight four that should be should be close enough we'll put two of these in parallel Here's where my little needle nose pliers were. You know, so I'm going back to these because these are sharper. And they cut better than these ones, which are, these ones have seen better days. These ones here have a tendency just to, just to crunch the wire and not actually break, not actually cut it. These actually take the tip right off and cut very clean not kitty scissors these are super sharp Klein electricians snips or scissors whatever you want to call them they're not cheap but they're very good and what's interesting is this one here I'm changing this 0.003 I mean this this, this one probably doesn't even need to be there tell you the truth it's uh, just in parallel with the 20 microfarad electrolytic it's on the electrolytic side this would be just to bypass any RF because the 20 microfarad is going to filter out the 60 Hertz this is just to um, get any RF that might get into the B plus line so 0 0.003 is the size I don't have a 0 0.003 I got a point zero zero four seven. That's what's going in place of it. But uh, that, those, that's what these ones are. These are just small little bypass caps, just to uh, take out any um, RF that uh, might find its way into the uh, rectified DC. Once again, we've got the outside shield connected to the ground point, and that's because this is the this uh, the job of this capacitor is to remove any induced. RF that's getting in and the outside shield would be the one that would pick up the most of the RF that it's trying to bypass so 
my outside shield goes to ground. Again, not as big an issue on modern uh, components as it was on the earlier ones. Of course, these electrolytics are probably going to have to be replaced anyway. Um, I'll just more than likely just bridge over these ones. But uh, for now, I'm not going to change them. I'm going to see how it sounds. See how, how much hum there is. I think I have four more. Four more of these paper ones to change and then uh, I can test this thing. Oh, for... Ground at point zero zero. I'm running out of these caps.
down to the last of the papers. One more right down in here. Point zero zero three. So, what have I got that's close to that? Probably a two two. Is as close as I've got to a point zero three. Going to this lug here, I'm just going to try and pull the old wire out, get the new one in place, get the new cap in place. Hell with it. I'll just cut the other one off when I'm done. Well, that has all the paper caps replaced. Now it's time to replace the power cord, as this one had no power cord on it when I got it. There's no strain relief here, so we'll make one. Gonna bring enough cord in here so that I can tie it off. I just need to get enough cord in. I can connect it to the two connection points. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap some tape around the cord behind the knot. And then I'll pull this back into the chassis. And what this will do is this will prevent the cord from being cut from the... I don't think there's any sharp edges here. They've already taken them down. But this is what's going to be pulled back through the back of the set. So I'll put some tape around here, tape it up good. This gives me a little extra buffer between the edges of the cabinet and the cable itself, the power cord.
so that when it's pulled back like this, it won't cut into the power cord. That's a poor man's way of making a strain relief. That's just based on where this power cord was cut. So obviously someone took it apart to take the cord off of it at some point. When I got the unit that had no power cord on it, I thought maybe someone just cut the cord, but the fact that it was cut off so deep inside the unit tells me somebody actually took this thing apart to take that cord off. Hopefully there's nothing major like a power transformer that shot. We won't know that until we go to power the unit up. I guess I could measure it, but what fun would that be? I got the preset tuners back in. Remember I said this is 1948 radio? There's the date code right there. August 1948. Looks like some of these have got some uh, original tubes in it. Uh, that one's looks like that's a GE tube. That one's been changed. That's a Marconi. Looks like just one tube may have been changed on here. We'll get the Six G five magic eye tube again. Put that back in. Okay, we're ready to power this thing up and watch for smoke. So like all my old vintage units, it is going to go into the light bulb current limiter. It's 
Good sign. Power transformer's not shot. If the transformer were shot, we'd have no lights. Turn up the volume and see if we get any noise. Well, you know what that means? We gotta change the filter. But, hey, that part's working. We know the power transformer's working. We know that the probably the output tube is working. And also, the rectifier tube is also working. We got a lot of AC hum, which generally is gonna indicate that uh, we have to change the big filter cap, or bridge the big filter cap. I expected to have to do that. I just wanted to see what would happen before I got to that point. So this thing's got 320s and a 10 in it. So I gotta find 320s. Well, they'll be bigger than that. I'm probably gonna put all like 33s or 47s. Whatever I've got, because I'm gonna have to find some high voltage caps. So I'll have to, I'm gonna have to take apart some old uh, uh, power supply, little uh, switching inverters to steal caps out of them because that's where I get them all from as I take them out of uh, old uh, power supplies. So let's find some caps. So I'm just constructing the four sided capacitor, the four, the four, it's a ba four banked capacitor is what it is. So what I've done is I've taken three or four, um, I think they're all like 33 microfarad, uh, yeah, 33 microfarad, 450 volt, which will be more than enough. I've taken four of them and I've just connected all the grounds in common and then I'm connecting the positive lead, I'm connecting a connection lead to the positive and we'll put some heat shrink tubing on here and then this is going to be um, put in the bottom of the chassis and uh, connected to the existing cap and I'll, I'll cut the leads off where they go into the cap Oops, that wasn't supposed to break. Have to do that one again. It's actually my connection there was a little bit on the big side anyway as far as getting the heat shrink tubing over, so I've got to make it a little smaller. I take this uh, this preset pack out again. I didn't have to actually undo these bolts at the front. They actually do nothing. They actually hold the, the controls in. It's just a it's just a friction fit. It fits in behind the chassis on this side. You can see here, 
and on this side it's held in place just by the two screws you just pull it down like that and it pops out so I'm, I don't have to disconnect this this time I'm just going to connect my four capacitors up here to the four main caps here and I've got them all marked the lead with the stripe on it is positive I don't have to worry about which ones which because they're all the same they're all the same value so let's connect them up here and uh, we'll see what happens with this thing and I'm not even going to disconnect the old cap at this point I just want to see if it's going to work we'll deal with taking the old cap out if it works we'll disconnect it And of course my ground, I have to ground this thing. That's going to be the fun part, grounding this, because uh, I don't have a very big iron, so as far as heating up the chassis goes, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I might be able just to connect it to one of these tabs. But, uh, it shouldn't require too much heat. I'll try this one down here first. I tape up the capacitor bank just to make sure there's nothing that's going to short out. I can just leave it sit in here. There's lots of room in the radio for this thing to sit. Just reattach the controls. And they go in just by placing the front lip in. And then sliding the back up in place just like that and putting in the screws. Pretty simple. Okay. One more time, I'll put the magic eye back in. And of course, this is just a cathode ray tube is what this is. Magic Eye was what they called it. 
tuning eye, magic eye, signal strength indicator. All did the same thing. Okay, we'll apply power once more. And we'll see whether this thing does anything more than hum. I don't know whether I'm in the right mode here for the the radio or not. I hear a bit of a hum, which is a good indication. I see nothing on this tuning indicator at all. And I don't hear any attempt at, wait. I do hear something, very, very faint. Now this thing doesn't have a built-in antenna, so I bet I'll have to Check out the heater on the rectifier tube. It's going extending well beyond the indirected heated cathode. All the way to the top here. Interesting. So I'll have to do some more tests to see why this thing's not working. So stay tuned for part two when we troubleshoot this beast and see whether it's gonna work again. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one real soon. Bye for now.